Stage tonight, four athletes, four leaders. Paul McGrath, Cleon O'Connor, Andy Lee, and Jamie Heaslip. But first, would you please give it up for triathlete, stand-up comedian, carry man, crappy quiz master, and presenter of Off the Ball. Look at his hair, he got it cut especially for tonight. It's Mr. Owen Sheehan. <laughs> None of those things are through. Thank you very much, everyone. You're very welcome to the Alex Hotel. What a lineup we have for you tonight. It's absolutely brilliant. We've got Paul McGrath, everyone. Yeah. Clean O'Connor, everyone. Yeah. Andy Lee's going to join us. Yeah. And of course, Mr. Jamie Heaslip. Yeah. This show couldn't be possible without our friends over at Free Now. Europe's first taxi app, just as our panellists have overcome challenges and helped us to drive efficiency and promote excellence in their sports, Free Now have been leaders in embracing digital technology and re revolutionising travel for businesses and individuals. Are you ready to get our guests out tonight? Can we get one more massive cheer for Paul McGrath, Clean O'Connor, Jamie Heaslip and Andy Lee? You're very welcome, folks. So just before we went on air there, Paul, we got a good gauge that about 80% of the people remember USA 94. It's a good sign. That's quite good. That's quite good. 25 years ago last month was Giant Stadium. Oh, yeah. That's not, that's not good. <laughs> 25 years flashed in. Does it flashed feel like in. yesterday? Yeah, it does, of course. You know, yeah. Uh, one minute you're playing football, the next minute you're just, you know, uh, scrapping a living. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, is what you're doing. <laughs> oh, no, not here though. This, this is brilliant. This is brilliant. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm going. <laughs> great stats, great stats. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Feel great after move that. on, move on. <laughs> Talk to us about that game. We'll, we'll do a few minutes on this on Italy. What was your body like going into that game? Um, no, I, I, I had a virus in my left shoulder and it wasn't, I should never have been on the pitch to be honest, but uh, a few injections and stuff like that and uh, uh, Mick Byrne, doing what Mick Byrne does, uh, didn't help at all really, to be honest. <laughs> no, I still, I still couldn't use my, my left arm, but it was, it was the kids around me that, you know, Phil Babb and, and Dennis Irwin and... and uh, no, seriously, Phil, <laughs> Phil did his part, he did his part, seriously. They, they pu pulled out some great tackles and... We all play. We, you know, we saw the crowd when we walked out, and we just thought, "There's no way we can lose. We can lose this game today for the for the crowd," because it was about, uh, I'd say, three quarters full of Irish. So that was a, a huge thing. You just didn't want to lose, and they, and they made us change our gear because we were wearing the wrong gear. So they were spouting off about that beforehand as well. So um, we just we just changed gear, and we came out in the green, and it was appropriate that. Uh, you know, we beat them on the day. Ray, of course, again pops up with a, a, a magnificent goal. Does this, is it mainly adrenaline that gets you through that game when it comes to the shoulder? Um, yeah, and a lot of luck as well, to be honest. Seriously, because uh, I think Baggio had a, a shot in the first half, I think, that hit me, well, it hit me in the chest. But, but, you know, he was such a talented player that you couldn't give him any sort of room at all. But he, uh, everything he hit seemed to hit one of our players. So it was, it was, it was one of those days that we were blessed to, to, to win it. We want to talk briefly about the Netherlands game as well, and I think we should just tee this up by playing this. Jason McIntyre here for Ireland. Facing up to Newman, back to Hout, up across to McGrath. He's just given it for Paul raising his boot. It was a great bit of skill. Instinctive, yeah, for me. It was just, I, you know, I saw him coming and I thought, just lift it over his head. Don't touch him. 
Um, normally I would have really tried to kick him in the face. <laughs> no, no, he, he was a fabulous footballer, but he was, he was messing there. I, ne I honestly never did touch him, and, and so I thought it was a good goal. But, um, you know, once you see the ref, uh, you, you... But they were the better team on the day, as I've said, so, so they deserve to win, so... I'd say Frank Reichardt never recovered from that horrific head no, injury. No, no, I, I, he was hospitalised after that, I think, for, for a long, long time. So, but he was, uh, he was a hell of a player and he knew how to play it up. And he, he, uh, as I said, I think we would have been beaten either way, to be honest, on that day. And is the body worse going into that game or did a few days after Italy kind of... Yeah, I think it was just slowly getting... Because the, it was so hot out there. The Mexican game was, was just mm. a, a frightening game for me because they were just... They were laughing at us, basically, you know. And... Uh, um, they were brilliant as well. They could play football as well. I, th I just thought we'd, they were little guys, so we just had to smack a few of them, you know. <laughs> but uh, they, they, they were a really good team. So, and, and again, you have to hold ha your hands up. Um, if we could have gone jo John Aldridge on earlier, maybe, because John was uh, John would have would, John was gunning for a few of them <laughs> when he when he came on and he scored the goal, which actually ironically got us through the next stage. So. If we'd have brought him on a bit earlier, I think we'd have, we'd have done better. Jamie, we, we talk about injuries there. You were somebody who was quite lucky throughout your career to actually play at the very top of your game. How much of a leadership asset is that to be able to be fully fit all the time? And conversely, if you played with people who managed to fight through injuries all the time, how much of a boost does that give teammates? Um, I don't know, it's a weird one. Considering that I then ironically ended my career because of an injury, um, it's not lost me, that irony, but it's, um, you know, being... It gave me consistency, I suppose. It gave, you know, maybe the team consistency as well, that I was, I was there for such a long time, regardless of injuries and different guys in the leadership group falling in and out. It kind of gave a consistent theme, I suppose, throughout the whole time. Um, but yeah, no, like, I mean, injuries are just so prevalent in the sport that you kind of just get used to guys dropping in and out. And, and the thing about them now is that they're, they're not there's not more injuries, they're just, the injuries are just more severe and they're just out for longer now. So it's, it's becoming even more common where a guy's gone for like nine months or 12 months and then they're just back on the scene again. And like take Josh van der Fryer is probably a great example recently or Sean O'Brien has had his injuries, you know. Um, and it just becomes part and parcel of the game now and, and you just look for consistency in terms of the values and, and your approach to the game. And, and that's what I always try to do, you know, kind of set the standard and, and keep it consistent no matter the changes. Did you feel bulletproof at any point? Uh, I used to kind of tell the lads that I had Wolverine blood for a while <laughs> um, and go around and just joke. But I was kind of like, I, I suppose I was like taunting faith, you know what I mean? Because I was like, it's going to happen. Like, I, I, I was lucky as it was with regards to injuries and I was like you know that's uh, most injuries like you can reduce them down by you know doing a lot of prehab and rehab and being a good pro but like then there's you know a certain tackle you get hit a certain way and next thing you you know look at Dan Levy you know you you, you do what you do you know he's he's had a we all know he had a pretty horrible injury you know what I mean um off a tackle nothing to do with him you know what I mean or you, your foot might get caught in a certain place you know in a rook or something like that um, so I just kind of laughed in its face. It was like, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If not, like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and enjoying it. Um, but by no means was I bulletproof. You know, I, I made sure that I, I worked bloody hard to, to do control what I could control. Yeah, for sure. Like, I guess that leads to a certain element of calmness. Like Joe Schmidt said, you do pressure points very well. And I guess one of those variables, which is, is my body going to actually let me down today, was yeah. taken out of the equation for you. Well, yeah, like, I mean, like anything, when you prepare for anything, you know, if you put in the work and trust the process and, you know, the way I used to work it, like, come, like, if a game was Saturday, you know, my work was done on a th by Thursday, you know, Friday and Saturday were, were actually just sit back, relax and let it happen kind of thing. And you knew that because, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you, you ticked all the boxes, did everything you had to do. And, and that's why when it came to big games that you were like, no, I've, I'm, I'm good, I'm good to go. And you were kind of, that's why... You, you, you trusted in yourself and the work that you did. How big an example was that to everybody else then, the idea that you could actually set the standard in training? How intense was it? Um, it was funny, we were talking about this outside in regards to Joe and how he used to set the tone in sessions. And um, yeah, Joe could be intense. Um, like, especially in, in training sessions, he purposely creates environments that are like real pressure cooker environments where he'll be he'll be shouting at you if you're dropping the ball like he'll be he'll be penalizing you, he'll be giving you 
load of abuse, but he, he's doing it. He's criticizing your mistakes while you're on the pitch. Off it, he's not. You know what I mean? Also, he's quite constructive and looking for you to get better. But on it, he creates that pressure environment, puts time restrictions on us, fatigues us as well. Um, and then try to make us make decisions while we're fatigued. And he, all he's doing is trying to mimic what's happening on the on the pitch and create that pressure environment. That really, it's so hard to like even for a fight, I suppose. You know, it's so hard to actually create like what a fight is like in training. You know, full full throttle. You know, that's what it's like with training. It's really hard to actually create. Now, it's really good that we have all the data and stuff. You see all the guys wearing the GPS packs and everything's tracked now. Um, and it's good to get that and try and mimic it, but it, it's still not the same. It's never the same. Yeah, like uh, in Kleena, in the uh, Blue Sisters documentary that was released last year, Mick Bowen was talking about the idea of actually creating those match environments. I think like they blasted out the national anthem at training and stuff like that on speakers to try and create the feeling of Croke Park on All Ireland Final Day. Yeah, well, I guess whatever sports you're playing in, when you're getting to the top level and you're playing big matches or, or big competitions, big fights, you don't want any surprises on the day. So you don't want to be thrown by something as... I suppose is silly or, or not, it's not silly, I shouldn't call the national anthem silly, but something <laughs> as, you, you know, something like that. That If that throws you off, then I would say you haven't prepared well, you know, and I suppose when you're talking about developing athletes, my ethos would be how far away do you have to go from your sport in your training? How close can you keep it to your competition environment? And that's where the magic is. If you can get people operating at that level more often than not, then they're really preparing for competition. When did you realise that? Um, I suppose when you're, when you're coaching people, and especially in GAA, because you have to be so efficient with your time in GAA. You're not dealing with people who have two or three sessions every day. You're dealing with people who you see three or four times a week, maybe. So as a coach, am I going to waste time getting people running in a straight line up and down the side of a pitch? Or am I going to do it with a ball in their hand? Can I achieve the same physical... Um, outcomes while playing a game and with the you know availability of GPS and all that you could that makes that job easier but I need to be as efficient as possible with my players time in order to make sure they're getting most bang for their book out of their sessions because with GA they got to go do their day job they got to go home and, and do all the other things of an of a regular life you know Andy how would you prepare for your biggest fights in terms of getting to that level in training it's very hard um in, like compared to these here, you, like in team sports, you might have played the the person or, or the opponent or the team before. Where in boxing, it's very rare that you would have yeah. faced the opponent before, because obviously it results in one of you is getting beat. <laughs> um, so it's very hard. You obviously you bring in opponents who with similar styles, similar heights and a bit and builds. Um, but the, and the thing is with boxing, if they have someone from outside of your kind of familiar circle, who's your teammates in the gym, um, there is that competition involved as well. So that that kind of sharpens you as well. And you don't want anyone, because it's boxing and you're f basically you're fighting each other, you don't want anyone to get an edge on you. So there are like that's basically all you can do in terms of preparing for it. But a lot of it's done in the mind, and I'm sure everyone here is the same that you. For me, I would obviously try to put myself there, lying down in bed, closing my eyes, and trying to put myself in the dressing room, you know, rehearsing everything, going through it all mentally, getting your hands wrapped, getting the knock on the door, being ready, walking out into the arena, and trying to take it all in. Um, and then try to, like, I, I always, whenever I'd walk in to the fight, I would always get there early and make sure I walked into the arena and kind of got a feel for it so that the first time I ever walked in wasn't the actual walk to the fight, so that if I could, I would go. And sometimes I would get in the ring and move around, so that just to familiarize yourself, and you might look at something, something might catch your eye, like on the floor, there might be a sticker or a mark of something from a TV camera, and you, and you just notice that, and then when you come back out, you just say, oh, there it is. You know, just to familiarize yourself with it, and all those little things you do, just, to, just so that nothing, as Pina said, nothing's a surprise when you get there on the day. We spoke about playing through pain, it's a constant battle for a fighter to play through pain. Was there ever a moment where you didn't actually have to do that? No, like, honestly, in fights, <laughs> no, in fights, you don't, you don't feel it. You don't, you don't, you don't feel it. You might feel it, I don't know. Like, I remember the first time I ever got cut, um, and I was boxing, I was a really bad cut, and all I just remember was just 
red, and I didn't know what it was. Just all I was seeing was red out of one eye, and I realised that was cut. But you don't feel it. You don't. It's not till after, and it might not even be the, the night of it. It's the next day when you feel. It. I'm sure, Jamie, and I, it's the next day, isn't it? When you're sitting down, you're waking up, and you just, you know, that's that's when they hit you. But um, <laughs> I was always lucky even boxing not to not to have many injuries, and uh, maybe it's, Jamie's the same because you're building up that conditioning. Um, that those muscles and those instincts, like when punches are coming at you and you're getting used to taking them and absorbing them and then you're also the avoiding them, that I think over a span of time, I was always lucky not to get in. It's, it's like something, like if I, we used to play like, we'd do one, but we'd have like a five-a-side soccer game and I'd, ha I'd get injured more, more yeah. than ever in a five-a-side soccer game, than ever, like sparring 12 rounds. You know, it was doing something that's, some, that's not, I think a lot of people push themselves in training and uh, try to do something different and try to do more than they have to and end up getting injured because it's not what their body's used to. So football's officially more dangerous than boxing? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> much, much. <laughs> Kevin Moran used to take my cuts for me. <laughs> Kevin Moran used to take all the cuts. Uh, can you relate to that, that idea that it's really the next day before you feel it, like against Italy that day? That Kevin felt them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Kevin used to put his head in where boots were flying and he was just ridiculous like he played the Gaelic over here of course so when he went over there he thought you know you just it, you know when the ball comes over you just stick your head in anywhere and there was boots flying he always walked off with this ridiculous looking bandage on his head like you know what I mean but I, but I let him do it I said well done Kev well done <laughs> Hoggy or someone would come on and just replace him and we'd you know we'd go on we'd still lose but that, 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 that's, that's the way we've done it uh, we wanted to chat uh, about your relationships with coaches and managers and all that sort of thing. There's a multitude of names we could start with here. I think, if it's okay, Paul, we'll start with uh, Alex Ferguson. Wonderful man. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, the United supporters. <laughs> that was, yeah. Do, do you generally believe that when you, when you say wonderful man? I honestly do, because it, w what he's done for Manchester United is, is just phenomenal. Like, you know what I mean? He's just brought, uh, you know... There was um, Bill Shankly and people like this who were, who were great managed for all, uh, Bob Paisley. But um, when he first came down, I was told, Brian Robson actually came to me and actually said, uh, he doesn't really kind of want you in the kind of club. He was trying to put it nicely. I mean, that meant he wants you out. So I, I was a bit disappointed because I was playing in the first team and I was doing quite well. Like, but I was still I was messing about. Like, in, I mean, I would say me because then I got moved on to uh, to Aston Villa and you know things went uh, a hell of a lot better. Were you ever seriously considering the retirement thing at that point? Yeah, they'd offered they'd offered me amount, an amount of money and it was quite a lot of money for for me anyway. <laughs> Um, and I was thinking of just coming back to Ireland and doing roofing. I, I put uh, slates on roofs, you know. So if anyone wants their roof, <laughs> roof I'm still doing it. Um, no, but I, but I, you know, I thought, you know, that's quite a, you have a, then you'll let you be able to buy a house in Ireland and then you can go back to the roofing, seriously. But then when I thought about it, I thought, but I can still play football, so I'm not, I'm not taking any, and, Ironically, it was that uh, Ronnie Whelan had said that uh, Kenny Dalglish, I think, was the manager at the time, and, and Ronnie had come up to me at one of the Irish uh, games and said, uh, what would it take to get you over to Liverpool? And I was thinking, oh, that's a, that's a strange one. Mm. But it, it gave me the belief that I could still play football, so I just kept that mantra going that I was still going to play football, no matter what he said to me, no matter how much money he threw at it, I was going to play football, and, I, and that's what I'd done. Would you have played for Liverpool? I don't... Is there any... <laughs> if, if that's the only club that came in, they were, they were a brilliant club. They were winning the league, you know, uh, every second. Well, I, well, they were winning loads of leagues, put it that way. Um, and yes, I would have. I would have, you know. Uh, but Aston Villa came in and, 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 you know, everything suddenly happened for me. It was, it was absolutely brilliant. And I had someone who believed in me, uh, Graham Taylor, uh, obviously, God rest his soul. He's, he just doubled my wages and all these things were happening for me. And I was thinking, how the hell can he do that? You know, uh, Aston Villa can double my wages, but Manchester United, when you go in to discuss your wages, won't even talk to me. <laughs> so, so I was, uh, yeah, I, I was delighted to go to Aston Villa. We'll come to Graham Taylor in a moment, but just one more thing on Alex Ferguson. When was the first time you actually encountered the hairdryer? 
Oh, Jesus. Um, most mornings. Mm. <laughs> Did his hair before I was leaving. <laughs> Um, no, I just, I just, me and Norman just, it was like a, it was like a swinging door, like me and Norman used to go, what's, what's the price, what's the price? He fined us all the money they were giving us, like, you know what I mean? So you basically, you weren't, you were playing for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was my attitude anyway, to be honest. Because I'm interested in that, when a new coach comes into a club, there's obviously a bit of time for them to get to know everybody and a bit of time before they're comfortable in themselves. And I dare say Alex Ferguson needed to feel like he owned the dressing room and feel comfortable in himself to actually give you a bit of stick. Um, yeah, oh, he felt comfortable giving me stick, all right. <laughs> you know, and, but he was right to, to, to do what he did. I, I've never uh, disputed that part of it, but he just could have let me have a chance to, to, to play football for the team first and uh, see whether I was going to turn out all right or not. But he just kind of steamed into me for some reason. You know, I was playing with the, the under-17s or the, or the reserve team. Or uh, I played at Altrincham one day, and it was just... I made one bad pass, and Sir Alex was, I happened to be at the game. Brian Robson was playing in that game as well. Now, it wasn't the under-17s or something, but Brian was coming back from an injury, and I was just playing for the under-17s. And... You know, I, I made one bad, bad pass, and at, at halftime he said, <clears throat> what are you doing, um, you know, trying to click a ball with the outside of your foot and stuff like that? And I actually went to the person I meant it to. And I said, well, I knew it would get to him and stuff like that, but he was, he, was, he was just raging, you know, absolutely raging. So we had a few words and stuff like that. We, it never came to, uh, you know, it never came to standing up and uh, wrecking him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm only joking. <laughs> there, he had two bouncers either side of him. Uh, Jamie, what was uh, the coach that you had the thorniest relationship with? Oh, um, the thorniest relationship with? Uh, I, I was lucky. I, I got on well with most mm. of my coaches. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Well, no, like, I mean, none of them were, like, none of them were dickheads. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and they weren't, they, that wasn't their kind of modus operandum of, of using a hairdryer treatment. Um, the, the one that just served it up to you, like jo Joe was probably the, the best and the worst um, at giving feedback. Um, you know what I mean? He just like, he's the type of guy, he'd be looking you in your eyes, smiling at you and stabbing you in the chest <laughs> at the same time. You know what I mean? Like he would just, he would just deliver it to you straight. And he would have no problem doing it in front, in the whole room. With, uh, like, Monday morning review is like, lads are dreading it. Like, if you made a mistake in a game, and even if you, you think you didn't make a mistake, he was going to pull up something that you, like, any sort of laziness or anything like that, he'd, he'd find it and he'd, he'd expose it and have no problem putting it up on the board. And he did that with everything. He, did that, he does that with, like, the guys get, like, um, DEXA scans to see what their body fat is. That goes up. You know what I mean? And... It, yeah, like, it's, it's brutal. Um, but I suppose that's what he wants. He just kind of openly, like, sets the standard. This is it. And everyone gets it. Like, you talk about coaches making an impression. Day one of Joe in Leinster. Um, first training review. And it's up on the screen. And Johnny throws a, I think it was Johnny throws a pass to, to Dricko. But it's kind of down at his legs. And Dricko doesn't catch it. And, uh, you know, Brian was about to launch into, like, you know, it was down at my ankles, what do you do? And, and like, straight away, Joe just cuts him off and was like, no, good players catch them. <laughs> and this is like, everyone's in the room, like, going, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's actually just fucking giving Draco a hassle, like. <laughs> uh, because up until then, let's say Chex probably was a little bit kinder on Brian before then. Um, and everyone was like, and, and I'd say he probably, he was looking for something as well because he just want, he wanted to set the tone. And from then on, like, every, and no one is, is um, not held accountable. And I think that's what you want. You, like, I, that's what I always got from the, from the coaches, you know. Uh, Stuart's the same. Uh, Leo's the same. You know, they're, they're very direct, open and honest. But, like, you can go have a chat with them then afterwards, no problem. Like, the only problem with Joe was that, like, we used to have this running game of seeing how long you can talk to Joe without it coming back to rugby. <laughs> um, and best of luck, you're getting it over four or five minutes, like, because it just always comes back to, because he's such an encyclopedia of the game, always comes back to your minutes. You know, end of year review, for example, you go in, you walk into the room with him and he'll have an A4 sheet 
and you'll have the game and the minute in the game and the mistake you made. So like if you're going to argue with him over something, he's like, no, 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 we have it here. Let's pull it up in the video. Oh. And oh. you can't, like, what, mm. what do you do? Like, <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of how it was with, with Joe. So if you're playing that game and you want to get to four or five minutes, what are you touching on? What is Joe Schmidt interested in? So he loves, he loves horse racing. Right. Right. So to get talking about horse racing, you might get two or three minutes. You can only really do that when Cheltenham's on. You know what I mean? Um, and then outside of that, like, it's tough. Like, <laughs> it really is. Not his family, no, or anything. Like, you might ask, like, oh, you know, how's, how's the missus? How are the yeah. kids? You know, and he might do the same. But again, like, within a minute, Straight it's away. back on rugby. And you're just like, here we go. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> apparently, because Ferg McFadden has good knowledge of, of, um, of the horses, I think he kind of part owns a horse, uh, he was able to, I think he nearly got past the five-minute mark, nearly. But I don't think anyone's ever been successful. Right, okay. So those, those Monday morning sessions then, when yeah. it comes to you, were you featuring prominently? Were you featuring often in those Monday morning some sessions? Day, like some days, yeah, some days, no. Now, the, the, the joy I had, well, I don't know if it was a joy, but um, like I worked with Joe from when he came to Leinster, obviously, in 2010. So I, I had him for so long. So when he came to Ireland, like, it was really funny seeing all like, the guys that hadn't been in Leinster absolutely shit themselves <laughs> uh, because of what they thought Joe would be like and how he's very you know, direct. And, like, you'll get on very well with Joe if you, know, if you deliver on what he wants, right? So what he wants is, like what most coaches, is do your job and know your role. So once you know that, and the way he plays the game is in such a structured format, that once you know that um, and you, you execute your role and you don't mess up, um, you know, you'll get on pretty well with him, and uh, and also if you're pre if you're honest as well, um, and like you own you own your mistake. But you know, in turn, in, that's the culture that has been created in in both Ireland camp and and, and Leinster. I can't speak for the other clubs, obviously, but uh, like that kind of brutal honesty is uh, that's part of the culture. The players will own their mistakes well before a coach will. If, if you look at the slew of previous Leinster coaches, you would have thought that the coach who might have the greatest potential to provide a hair dryer treatment would have been someone like Michael Cech, but you got on really well with him. I got on well with Czechs, yeah. He, he, you know, he had some spicy blood in him, some hot blood in him at times that would, would, would go off, and, and he was quite emotional after games. Um, but, yeah, I, I was, again, I was lucky. I was kind of part of, like, if, if he liked you, it was fine. If he, if he didn't, like, there were other players now that, you know, had a tough time with him, or Czechs would have given them a a really tough ride but he would have respected you at the same time if you stood up to it because at the time he came into a club where he had to clear house the culture wasn't that great and you know he purposely went on hard went hard on fellas that he kind of wanted out of the club if I'm honest um, and if you watch the turnaround from when Czechs came in in 05 to 08 or 09 like it's it's chalk and cheese in terms of the turnover of players in that clubhouse. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's extremely ruthless. And I'd be interested to get your take on that, Kleena, actually, the idea that a coach should show tough love or whether or not it's a one-size-fits-all approach for everybody in the dressing room. I think a one-size-fits-all maybe is a bit too simplistic mm. because, um, we'll put it this way, as an athlete, you want your coach to push you because you, their job is to make you better. So if, if a coach doesn't point out your weaknesses, doesn't challenge you, you're not going to get any better. So it's the best players, I think, are comfortable in that environment yeah. and comfortable yeah. sitting there going, Jesus, yeah, that was my mistake. And yeah, do you know what? Good players would catch that ball. And I want to be a good player, so you're dead bloody right, you know? So it can be a little bit uncomfortable at the time and it can be sometimes hard for coaches to deliver that um, but the best coaches just deliver it straight without any messing around or fuzziness yeah. or anything like that just give them the information to make them better athletes that's, that's yeah. the key piece and I think that's how you deliver it that then to each person is slightly different so everyone gets the honesty everyone gets that straight up feedback but some people might need a little bit more support dealing with it. Other people can, can stand on their own two feet a little bit more. So what was that saying? Everyone treated fairly, but no one treated the same. Sure. Like really good coaches have that yeah. ability to manage a person while making them better and challenging them. You know? And is that, speaking on behalf of Dublin Hurling there, is that the culture that exists in your camp at the moment? 
Yeah, it's a culture we're trying to develop, that sort of accountability. It's, it's a key part of it, you know. If everybody's working so hard for a common goal and, you know, Paul's working really hard and I'm, I'm cutting corners, you know, you're, you're taken away from more than just yourself, you're taken away from everybody. And there has to be trust in the group that, you know, people will make mistakes and, and you're able to call people out and know that they, they can accept it and move on and say, Do you know, hands up, I'll, you're dead right, you know. The, the, I think the, the weaker players or the players that don't succeed are the ones that when they're challenged they'll, find, they'll point to someone else yeah but it was a shit pass or yeah but this or whatever yeah 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 but yeah but the exceptional players will say yes where did I how did I contribute to that match that we lost by two points or that ball that went astray they're the exceptional players Does Matty Kenny run a similar video analysis system to Joe Schmidt? Um he runs a video analysis system, yeah, he does. Um, yeah, like, again, Maddie, Maddie's attention to detail is, is very, very high. And uh, he, yeah, he, he tries as best he can not to bullshit people and to give them that evidence. Because that's, that's the beauty of video analysis now. There's no hiding, you know, it's, it's there for everybody to see. So you just have to stand up and take it, I guess. Yeah. I think a really, a really good one as well, just like, I hate to be banging on Joe, but like, what, what his actual... Like really good coaches have is really good emotional intelligence to that point exactly where they know how to deliver the point to someone. They might take them aside and say, look, you did this, that and the other. It wasn't great. And I think you, should, you need to improve by doing X, Y and Z and then deliver it in front of the group or others. They'll just, they know they're fine. They can just deliver it straight. So it's all about, you know, how they're able to read the group as a collective and then the individual and how they communicate that across. Well, well, that's interesting because the emotional intelligence of a coach is something I wanted to get to with you, Andy, and Emmanuel Stewart. I mean, when it comes to great coaches around the world, Stewart is, is up there in terms of people who had that emotional intelligence, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, um, but again, different with everybody. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, from, like I lived with him for eight years, Sometimes he would be quite hard on people, you know, and I never understood why. And I thought, but it, it is, it's drawn, drawn what, what, what clicks with the individual, isn't it? It's, they're different and demanding a lot. But he was always right, even though sometimes I would like question it, but he always knew, even though he was never coached like we'd get up in the morning and run, and he would never be a coach to tell you to get up and run in the morning, you know, or tell you to do this many rounds in the gym. He was never like a taskmaster or a drill sergeant, but he would always knew what you were doing. And he always, like, he found some way to balance it out with the attention he would give to certain fighters, because he, he knew who was cutting corners. Um, and if you, were, if you were doing what you were meant to do, be doing, he always, he always made sure he was giving you as much attention as as your work de like deserved, you know, so, um, I, I, yeah, again, the emotional intelligence and, and I think, I don't know about, like you say, Joe Smith, they always, they have to be obsessed by it, don't they? Yeah. They have to be obsessed by it, like, but also the dynamic in the relationship he wants with you is a rugby, you know, and I think if, if you kind of see behind the, the curtain or whatever, uh, you're having those conversations where it's not about rugby, something, something might, no, some part of you might see him in the same light or in the same way so they kind of I always found like the dynamic is always going to be and it's always going to be the, the teacher and the, yeah. the pupil isn't it? it's never going to be where you're talking on about your kids and, and, and even playing for, like you know it's, there's always that kind of kind of has to be that respect of what he if he says jump over that wall I'm jumping over the wall yeah. you know I always, I always that's thought because like I always think in, in, in team sports anyway it's because like they want to keep that distance so they can drop you <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and they're not, they're not your mate, like, yeah. you know, and they make it very clear, like, yes, we have a good relationship, and, but this is a working relationship, and mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I have to do to make sure the team wins, and you're going to do what you have to do as a player to be part of that. But if you don't, you're not up to scratch. You know, good luck. <laughs> uh, how does Manny Stewart react when you do something wrong or that he's unhappy with? Is it a direct... Uh, bar no, but are... as I said, he would find a way to let you know. Like, right. it might just be a, pass, a comment in passing, you know, like, oh... Oh, so you let him, like, you know, if you didn't do what you should have done in Spiron, or if you had a bad day, or, you know, oh, so, yeah, you know. Sometimes he just come up and say, oh, yeah, he really whipped your ass today, you know, like, <laughs> and he knows that the like, next day you're coming in there, like, and you're going to, whoever it was who did that to you, they're, they're going to pay for it, you know, so, but he always just say, no two days are alike in the gym, you know, so some days you will have a bad day, and some days he would say, like, he, he, he knew if you tried, he'd say, well, look, it was just a bad day. 
But if you knew you, you, you didn't try or not that you didn't try to, something just wasn't right. If you were messing around, say if you were just trying to be aggressive when you should have boxed a guy, um, he, he let you know. Not, not in a direct way, but in, in, in some way. And uh, yeah, I thought like, yeah, so they have their ways, you know, their methods, like, and, and they let you know. Would you say you were a leader in the Kronk Gym in Detroit? Eventually, eventually. I think I always was, um, not, to blow, not to blow my own arm, but like within the team, even in the amateur team, that I would always make sure I was the first one home on the runs, always make sure I was the quickest on the track, always make sure that I was pushing myself the most. And um, and eventually when I went to the Kronk, I had to prove myself first, but then I kind of tried to set the standard for what other people, and even within Adam's gym, after a while where it became, I was kind of the veteran of the team, um, where you had like the Ryan Burnett and Josh Kelly coming in and and uh, Charlie Edwards and I was like Adam was saying to me like look at him that's how you do it like you're not coming in taking 45 minutes to warm up you're coming in you're getting your hands wrapped and you're getting down to work and you and that's and it was and and that, that was something I used to thrive off of, like knowing that I was setting the tone and and showing them I think yeah I think that 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 kind of role suited me I think. When did you realize that it was going to become a relationship between yourself and Emmanuel that would result in essentially you living with him, that you were going to become uh, very close to him as a human as well as a boxer? Uh, it's, it, I don't know when, when it happened, but it, it kind of happened uh, naturally. It kind of evolved that way, but I always had that reverence for him because of who he was even before I met him as a coach and then as a man, you know, and how he used to treat people. Like, uh, for anybody that doesn't know him, like he, was, he was the equivalent of Alex Ferguson in boxing and... Um, you know, he'd, he'd have as much time, he, like, from, we, I travelled with him a lot, and so I got to see him in all environments, dealing with promoters in boxing, dealing with lawyers, dealing with politicians, but also how he treated people, just the average man on the street, and in the streets of Detroit, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's not quite rough, uh, and a lot of homelessness, and, and he'd have as much time for, for those people as he did for anybody who you'd have in high, hell in high regard, so, you know, that's, that's, that's the type of man he was, and so you could not risk respect him you know and um yeah and as a, as a as a coach as a boxing brain he was a genius so i was very fortunate to be there you know yeah what was the expectation of him because he, he calls you around christmas one one year isn't it or it's oh a, yeah it's no from the day one it's like you're going to be a world champion you know that's it like and it's not like it's just like a given that you know you come here you train with us you could be, be world champion you know and that's and anytime he did like a, even before he even signed pro when he'd be talking to the press about me he'd be telling them, like, this kid's going to be world champion. But he was also telling me, you know, it, while I'm in the earshot, you know, that this is what's expected of you, this is how you're going to have to go about it, and there's nothing, that, anything less than that would be failure. Was he telling everybody in the gym that? Um, yeah, eventually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, eventually, yeah. So that, not a bad place to be. Like, I mean, it's, it's so interesting thinking about that, that you can look at team sports and you can look at individual sports, and it's very easy to just say, well, they're entirely different things. But really, it sounds like the Kronk was a team in itself. It was, and like, um, it was, and there was a lot of, like, I don't know, there was a, a way of thinking or a mindset within that, that, that gym that you have to win, and not just win, win by knockout. And um, if you got beat, you didn't show up. You know, if you got beat, you just, it was a hard place to be. You know, because it, it, they're not like they wouldn't be soft. They wouldn't be easy. Like you wouldn't want to have uh, how do I say? You wouldn't have well, like want to have feelings in there. You know, you wouldn't. Want to, <laughs> they'd let you know if you're good or bad. Like it's like and the Detroit people are very straight people. Like and they let you know straight away if you're good or bad. Or they'd, they'd throw you out of the ring. Like if you were stinking up the ring, if you were sparring badly, they'd get you out of the ring. You would, because the ring was only one ring in the whole gym. There must have been 50 fighters in the gym. So if you weren't swam well, you were getting out of there because somebody else was getting in to take it, you know? And if, so it's obviously a tough environment in the gym, but you're going home and you're living with Manny Stewart. If you've got any personal issues, if you're feeling homesick, do you go to him or does he, is he still a hard ass at home? Yeah, no, no, different in, in, that, in, in that way. We'd spend a lot of time together and he always made me feel comfortable. And uh, for, a lot, like, for a lot of times he would, like my younger brother would come over and stay with us and he allowed him to stay in the house as well, just to have that connection to home. Um, but we would spend a lot of time together. So, and I was a young man and I just kind of engrossed myself in it. So, like, although I did miss home at times, not as, not as much as I would have had I not been living with him. Yeah. yeah. 
like it's interesting thinking about that, the role that a coach has in somebody's life. And Clean, it's something that was actually, Emmett Fitzmaurice wrote about it a couple of weeks ago. He said that GA managers are now involved in every element of people's lives. He said he was dealing with relationship problems for some of his players uh, at, a, at some stage during his Kerry managerial career. Like it's gone to that level now. And I mean, uh, as you say. <laughs> I'm not a matchmaker. That's what you're saying. No. Um, yeah, I, I think the coach athlete relationship is is a really funny one because in some ways it's really intimate because as an athlete you're putting massive trust in this person you you're you're setting this you're chasing this dream it is your dream right the athlete's dream and they're putting huge trust in you and you've got to respect that as a coach i mm. think and i don't think oh, sometimes coaches don't you know they we've all heard of stories of coaches who treat people like shite you know but uh, you have to you have to make sure that the person is comfortable in their own skin is, is empowered to do what they're setting out to do you know I, I personally think the job of a coach is nearly to make yourself redundant because you want to fill people with confidence and self esteem and how better to do that than for them to believe I can stand on my own two feet and achieve what I want. Like, I don't, re I don't need to rely on a coach anymore. I know what I'm doing. And Andy, you were saying that about, you know, you knew what you were doing in the gym. You didn't need your coach standing over you and counting out anything because you were empowered to chase your own dream or manage your own training, manage your own day. And again, I think the, the best coaches fill you with that sense of, I suppose, self-certainty, you know, rather than looking for somebody else's guidance, you know. Yeah, you're an enabler, basically. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I should say we're here tonight with thanks to Freenow here at the Alex Hotel. Freenow is uh, Europe's first taxi app. Uh, just as our panellists have overcome challenges and helped to drive efficiency <laughs> and to promote excellence in their sports, Freenow have been leaders in embracing digital technology and revolutionising travel for businesses and individuals. Can we get a cheer for Freenow? <laughs> So we're talking about the relationship, uh, Paul, between, uh, <laughs> between ma managers and uh, their players on a human level. What sort of uh, human relationship did you have with Jack Charlton? Um, Father-son kind of relationship. Right, okay. Yeah, because I didn't like him on his first day because he started coming out with this, uh, these colours. We were running around the gym and his first training session we were running around the gym and he was talking puce and I didn't even know. W w is that a colour? Pews. It is a colour, I think. It was just the worst training session I'd ever done. And I was thinking, Jesus Christ, we've got him now for the next probably five or six years and something like that. But he eventually, I think Jack kind of uh, un understood that I was a bit... Um, what, how do you put it? Yeah, strange. <laughs> and, and, and so, no, honestly, he, uh, but I think he... he, he uh, the thing he gave me back, though, he always wanted me to, to be uh, in, the, in the squad, at least. And, and if, if, if I was ever in, in any way fit enough to get out on the pitch, then he, he would have me on the pitch, you know. And uh, so he was brilliant for me because he, he, he was one of those... He could, have, he could have just said to me, look, Paul, you're, you're messing around. Every time you come in, you're messing around. Because I had a bit of a, a problem with, um, with, with um, alcohol and stuff like that, so... Uh, so he could have cut me off well, well in, or, you know, well into the early years of his, his, his uh, um, job, but he stuck with me, and, and you know, luckily we went to a couple of World Cups and, and uh, European Championships as well. So I, I'm so grateful to him for for doing the the arm round the shoulder thing because that that's what uh, got me playing for Ireland. Um, and uh, didn't do much training, really, to be honest. But, <laughs> but, I, but I, loved, I loved playing for the man. Is it true that he took you fly fishing at one point or taught you how to fly fish? He, he tried to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. He was, he was up behind, to be honest, and they got great pictures of this, of course, as well. He was up behind me and he had me two hands gripped uh, uh, the, the, way, the thing in this, or the wheel, I was going to say. <laughs> that, uh, he had a rod in this hand and the, the, the what do you call it, the, the cord or whatever it is. The real and he was doing this and all the photographers were taking pictures of me and I was just going, oh Jesus Jack, the two of us look like idiots, <laughs> you know, but, but it was, it, he was really just trying to give me something to do with the lads, were, they went playing golf, the lads, I didn't play golf back then, I've since become a very good player, Pat will tell you that, <laughs> I still can't play, but, 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 I, but he was very good to me, Jack was just, you know, he didn't have to bring me on the, on the especially the, the, Itali uh, the, the, American thing because Dave O'Leary he, he told me earlier in the thing that Dave O'Leary could, could have stepped in for me so 
I trained so hard with Mick, Mick Byrne and I, I managed to go on that trip as well. And that's when, when um, the Italian came up, the Italian game came up and, and uh, I, I, you know, he got me playing, Mick Byrne got me playing on the pitch, so that was great. When it comes to your relationships with managers, I think it's fair to say that Graham Taylor probably had the most important relationship as a manager with you. Yeah, yeah, because that was that was a tough thing for me to do, to have to leave Manchester United, mm. who I thought I should still be with, sort of thing. Uh, but I think Norman left first, and I knew I wasn't long for the club then. And, um, yeah, when I was asked to leave, I, I just thought, well, at least I don't have to leave football. So, uh, yeah, I... I uh, I went up to Villa and Graham Taylor just was, was brilliant to, to me. You know, he said uh, on Fridays that the lads used to do this, just keeping up stuff and, you know, all that sort of messing around, flicking balls to each other and stuff like that. And, um, and I, just, I just was saying, well, I can't really be joining that and then be expected to play on Fridays and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I just, I just went out on Saturdays and just tried to do my best and stuff like that. And we, we did okay. There must have been such respect for you in the dressing room for you to be able to do that, for you to be allowed to go out on, on a weekend and perform. And I suppose it was those performances that sort of proved it to your teammates as well. Oh, yeah, but a, but a lot of the time I'd have to ask the lads to help me, you know, to, to give us a dig out and stuff like that because it, was, it really was a case of, of uh, letting them down sometimes. But then I'd try and make it up to them like by playing even better the next week and stuff like that because they, they, they helped me out an awful lot. And uh, I think we, on, on our first season, I think we came second. Uh, I think it was, was it, oh no, maybe Liverpool won, did they? Yeah, and we came, we came somewhere anyway. Um, <laughs> but we were right up there and it was, it was close. And, um, you know, so that was brilliant for Aston Villa. And then we wanted to build on that. We wanted, and, and the thing with us was we had such a good defence. De Derek Mountfield was playing, Kent Nielsen was playing and people like that. And they were really good footballers. And, of course, they were trying to get me in some sort of shape to help them defend <laughs> as well. You know, give us a hand here, Paul. So, um, you know, we started playing really good football and then one or two players came in, Dean Saunders and people like that, and we just took off. Daly and Atkinson, another one, God rest his soul, Hugo Ahiog and people like that. So up through my uh, Villa career, um, lo loads of players... Uh, that, that have left some of them that have left us as well but they, they just made it made it fun to go into training even if I didn't do as much as they did but it just made it fun to be with them you know so I, I had a great time and I guess that allowed your individuality to come out as well that this was what you did this was the player you were going to be and I mean not training during the week allowed the best version of Paul McGrath to come out on the pitch well yeah I thought yeah that's what I was trying to explain to uh, um, my the physio who was um, mm. Jim Walker and Jim would explain it then to the managers that came in. He explained it to Ron when Ron came back. And Ron was a bit dodgy. So he, Ron was saying, he what? He, go, to, I mean, he comes in on Fridays then, he does this. So Ron was, was a bit more difficult to deal with. But he was, he, you know, he let it, he let it, he allowed it. And, and we had a great, uh, great, great team. The lads were brilliant with me because they just let me away with murder. <laughs> and, and, and it was it, honestly but it, but it genuinely worked and my knees were shot to bits anyway that's the truth that individuality is such an important thing and it's something that all four of you can relate to um, Jamie when it comes to your individuality thriving in a dressing room I guess one, one of the more interesting case studies is uh, Eddie O'Sullivan telling you not to wear white boots fashionista Eddie O'Sullivan <laughs> how, how did that impact you in terms of the actual uh, view you had on uh, the way you could be an individual in, in the dressing room for Ireland? Uh, it probably didn't help at the time I had my tongue pierced as well. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that didn't help the scenario. Um, yeah, look, I had, a, I had a mixed relationship, I suppose, with, with, with Eddie. Um, and it, it didn't start off good, um, if I'm honest, because in camp he called me Graham, which is my brother's. Uh, he coached my brother, Graham, who's, who's a lot older than me. Um, and he said, oh, Graham, and I was like, I, I let that one slide, right? I was like, new in camp, coach, call you a different name, shh, say nothing, just be delighted that you're there. Um, the next day he said the same thing, and I said, it's Jamie, it's not Graham. 
And then the following week he did it as well and I corrected him again. And it was just like, I was like, fuck you, man. Like, <laughs> I, honestly, I was, I was so annoyed. Like, I found it so, honestly, I found it so disrespectful that he didn't know, he didn't know my name. Did he apologize? Never. Never. And uh, that's the difference, actually, between him and, take Joe, for example. Um, Joe will know the name of every single player in the squad. He'll know if, a lot of the times, they bring the, during the Six Nations, they bring the under-20s in on the download weeks, the, the weeks that there's no games, to do training sessions against. He'll know the names of all the under-20s players as well. He'll thank them all. He'll actually welcome them all. Because um, uh, a, a culture thing in, in, that, in, in Ireland is uh, you greet each other first thing in the morning or the first time you see the person in that day. So especially if someone new comes into the room, everyone will eventually go up and shake hands and introduce themselves. Um, so he'll, every under-20 player that comes in or new guy into the squad. Um, and that's what I think, yeah. So that put me on the, instantly just put the hair on the back of my neck up and I was, yeah, not, you know, warm to him, I suppose. And then obviously on the outside are trying to get into the squad. So, you know, you know you're like, oh, the world is against me kind of stuff as well. Um, but yeah, the, the kind of before my uh, first cap, he told me, he told me I, I'd, I'd never get capped wearing white boots. So I, I conceded a little bit. I got like black boots with had white trim going down the middle of them. But like I, I wore white boots for a couple of different reasons. And one of them was because I always struggled with, um, I'm like, I'm the son of an army man. He's very structured. You know, he wore a uniform for 40 odd years of his life. You know, um, yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir. Never question the orders coming down sort of thing. And obviously being raised in that environment, you kind of go against it. And yeah, like, it's like, why? Like, why? Yeah, you know what I mean? So that's why I would, would have gone against the stereotypes of, okay, why does a back row have to play a certain way? Or why doesn't the right have to play a certain way? Or, you know, why can't you do a bit of everything? You know what I mean? Or why do you have to wear black boots? Um, probably wasn't the attitude to have, kind of trying to start out in your professional career. You feel faster than white. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, I think you do, don't you? Yeah. If you put on white shoes, you feel faster. Yeah. If a man your shoes is wear all the crunk fighters wear white boots. When Klitschko and Lang Suits went to Manion, the first thing he did was give him white boots. Yeah. You feel faster. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. It's the old Gavin Hanson Light phrase, isn't it? Look good, feel good, play good kind of attitude. Um, yeah, but that was like... So myself and Eddie didn't really exactly get off, get on too well, and then I kind of, you know, whatever, forced my way in after after that World Cup that didn't go too well for them. I didn't realise that, so it was it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just address that. Did you did, did you get any little bit of satisfaction out of that being at home? So it's a weird one, right? It's kind of like when you when I finished playing. Okay, so it's kind of like you want them to do to do well but you don't want them to do too well without you. It's just this weird, weird head game that you play at yourself, you know what I mean? Because your ego kicks in, doesn't it? And, and your ego says, I want to be on that field. I want to feel really, really important to the team. Um, so when that happened, like, you got to understand, like, I'm trying my best to kind of break into that squad for the World Cup. Uh, I play one warm-up game, but I don't get into the squad. So you're I'm, I was gutted not getting into that squad. Um, and then you're seeing them play the way they play. And, and like at the time, you're kind of going like, oh, you know, I'd, I'd be the difference maker out there. But then when you kind of sit back, you're like, you wouldn't be. You know what I mean? Um, like as much as you think you're good, you, you wouldn't be the difference maker in the game. You know, they bloody Paul O'Connell, Brian O'Driscoll, Ron O'Gara on the team, like they're good. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, but a little bit of you is kind of... A little bit is like, like, yeah, I don't want to do too well, but you know, you're gutted for them at the same time because that was, that particularly that that group of players, for for the quality that they had, they won so little. They, you know what I mean? They actually re like, okay, you can say they won triple crowns. They never won a Six Nations. You know what I mean? Um, and for that group of players, they were so they were so good. I, I always feel a little bit gutted for them that they didn't kind of do better for themselves. But um, in terms of the ego, just like just a random story is um, you get it like so when I finished like you, you think you're important to a team and you think you play a really important role and I just signed a contract and it was like brilliant deadly um, but then you finish up and the year I finished up they went on and won uh, Six Nations European Championship and the Pro 14 all in the same year and I was like if ever there was a kick up the arse of going 
You know what, you're not that important to the team, mate. <laughs> it's all about the group, and the, but that's what it is. That's what we try to create, that it is actually all about the group and the creative and the strength of collective. And it's been a really good thing that's been developed, particularly over the last four years with, with Ireland, um, where you can see a lot of, like, take right now, there's a lot of injuries in the squad in key positions, but guys are just slotting in and playing in the system. Um, and, it, and they're still as successful as, as they've always been. Paul, what would Jack Charlton's reaction to white boots have been? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> they'd have been slung somewhere. <laughs> I don't think he'd have liked that, that sort of thing, no. I don't suspect so. Uh, Paul, you would have looked good in white boots. <laughs> what? You would have looked good in some white boots. <laughs> yeah, I, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have played faster, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because you've all given Free Now such a, a warm reception tonight, uh, <laughs> and as a thank you for coming tonight, uh, Free Now have given us 200 euro in taxi credit for three people here tonight. So if you have a route Ooh. under your seat now and you find an envelope, you are a winner. So oh. have a look and uh, yeah, yeah, give us a cheer yeah, yeah. if you yeah. happen to find anything. <laughs> Got a winner over here. Wanda. Winner, winner. Winner in the pink polo over here. Yes. <laughs> One down here as well in the grey t-shirt. Oh. And I'm sure there's a third winner somewhere as well. Congratulations, folks. One more, no? Okay, one more cheer for free now. I didn't put that on there. <laughs> I didn't put that on there. <laughs> Andy, we've been talking about uh, individuality there, and uh, it's something you've been speaking about with regards to your new venture in coaching with uh, Paddy Donovan. Uh, this is a guy who is uh, an individualist, I think it's fair to say, has his own unique style, is going to be a huge star according to you and key to that is mixing discipline with allowing his individuality to thrive. Yeah, and oh, he does a lot of good things already, you know, and, and he has a style, he's quite flashy, and, but that's, that's his, like I'm not sure how it translates into sports, um, but in boxing, your style will always reflect your character or your personality, as, you know, how you fight. It's, like for me, I would be quite strategic, I think. Or I w I'm always a counterpuncher anyway, and I would kind of have a, like to assess my opponents and then exploit their weaknesses. Where Paddy, he's he's quite flash. You know, he's got streaks, blonde streaks in his hair. He's you know he's got he's, he's on Instagram, <laughs> you know that kind of thing. Like. <laughs> so he's that's how he's gonna fight, and I can't change that. You know, I don't. If I try to change that, I can't. So I just have to just add small things. And he's only young, so. Um, but it's a challenge for me as well because I did learn from two, two I think, believe two of the best coaches in boxing, and before that, Zor and Billy Walsh in the amateur system. So, um, it, it like it is. It's hard. I don't know. I'll be looking forward to looking to beat the cleaner after this. But it is. It's hard. It's it's a different role, and it's not something that I have a great deal of confidence in. I know I, I will improve him. I know I can. But I think I have to find my way as well and find out what coach I am. In, in in the process of of training him as well because, um, and at this early stage, like I'm not like I will ask him, are you happy with how training is going? Because I, like, is there things that you feel? And like so far, he's he's happy, but we'll see. Like you know, we'll see how it goes. But uh, like it's hard. It's, it's hard. You don't. You do want to push. Obviously, I'm pushing him physically, um, but you don't want to ask anything that he's not able to do or willing to do. You know or so it's 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 it's, it's isn't it? It's it's a it's a tough one. As as per someone who's done it at a high level themselves, it's 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 just, it is a tough one. You know, it's it's. But I'm very confident in him. Like I I I, I could just leave him. I could just get him fit now, and he'd beat most people because he's that good. You know, he's not not that he needs a lot of things, but um, like he will he will improve. I think, yeah. Well, Tina, is that something you can kind of relate to, kind of finding out what coach you're going to be? Yeah, well, I think as a coach, you, you, first of all, you do got to find out what your values are and how you are going to present yourself as a coach. And then after that, you're nearly like a chameleon because we talk about that emotional intelligence. So you got to nail down your values and then you've got to be different people or a different person for different people, depending on what they need, you know. Um, but uh, talking about dealing with flashy people, a, a kind of a coaching mentor of mine had this thing about the, the boyo, as he called them. He was like, the boyo, they will drive you insane. They're the fellow who won't train during the week, you know, <laughs> or the fellow that will wear the white boots or be on Instagram or have the streaks <laughs> in his hair with the swagger, all of that stuff that drives you insane, absolutely insane as a coach. But they're the fella that will get the goal. 
or mm. they're the fella who will hit the knockout punch or whatever it is. And you can't, in an effort to control as a coach, you can't s shove everyone into the same yeah. system sometimes. You've got, well, what makes him brilliant? It's that swagger, mm. you know, and that flashiness that makes him brilliant. So your job is to make them brilliant, not to make them conform to whatever you're doing. So you've got to sort of, as my friend told me, you've got to embrace that boy a bit because that's that spark that is so important in sport. That is the difference between winning like, and losing. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, I don't know, Paul, you, you, you spoke about like your preparation wouldn't have been that, like, you know, wouldn't have been ideal, I suppose. <laughs> or, 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 or Alex Berg, I don't know, I don't know. But like, sometimes you, you see what, these what guys, I don't know. Why are you? Wait, no. Get up and, come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, genius and madness go hand in hand a lot yeah. of the times, don't they? And some guys you'll see, like, it, they'll just, they'll never train. They won't even know how to throw a jab, but they'll just walk in and beat, beat the, 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 the bricks out of you, you know? And they're just yeah. like, and there is, there's, you sometimes you just have that little bit of madness that, and it <laughs> kind of go hand in hand with, with, with genius, you know? And you've seen it, like Maradona, like, uh, you would say, like, Roberto Duran as a fighter, but uh, they, they kind of, they, these two things kind of, yeah. these two elements of the personalities, and they go hand in hand, I think, to you, I don't know. Like, but in saying that, you can also be, reach your, like, be a brilliant boxer or a sports person if you do be very professional. You know what I mean? I don't think, you just, <laughs> like, I'm not advocating for like, going on the beer and never training and then going straight in there and knocking somebody out. But I'm Damn. saying, no, there is a, there's a, there's a like oh, Kleena said, it's, yeah. it's a balance, yeah. isn't it? You know, of, yeah. of yeah. The, the personality. But it depends on the person. Some people mm. get to their best by being consistent and yeah. doing their yeah. prehab and their rehab yeah. and, and following that type of structure That's all the time. I was that. I had to yeah. have every. I couldn't leave a stone unturned because I'd know it myself and I'd, yeah. I'd have a doubt about it. Exactly. But some people aren't. Not everyone's the same. Yeah. Yeah. So your philosophy is: don't put a straight jacket on it whatsoever. Just allow them to thrive as an individual. They've got to thrive. It's got to be an environment they thrive, and you've got to figure out for everybody what is it. What is the environment that brings the best out of them? So if it is structured, you've got to do eight reps and three sets, and then you've got to do this exercise and all that kind of rigid structure. Some people need that. Some people, it suffocates them. And th that's hard as a coach because you, your job apparently is to provide all this structure. So if some, you, you can feel that, oh God, I'm not, I'm not doing that for this person. Maybe they don't need you. Mm. You know, coaches have egos as well, you know, and we think, oh, we can solve everyone's fucking problems, but we can't, you know. Sometimes the athlete knows way better than you do. You just let them at it. Let them go out and let them do their thing, you know. That's interesting because it's like going from a player to become a coach or a manager or whatever it may be, that desire to get to the very top of your game as a player is clearly translating as a coach. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's ambition. It's all ambition, you know. So if you're a player and you want to win a World Cup, win an All-Ireland, win whatever it is your sport is, coaching is you, you don't, you're just an ambitious person and you want to try and get your players your athletes to the best to the top it's it's the same process the same attitude just in a slightly different role you know Jamie when it comes to structure is that something that you enjoyed did you kind of like the idea that Kleena said they're being told what to do on the training ground in particular um yes and no mm -hmm. um I my personal philosophy is I think like when it comes to a team, I think you have to control certain parts and certain elements of the game that are controllable, given your game. It could be a bit harder in, in hurling and in football. Um, in, in rugby, there is set plays. You know, you've got line out, scrum, you know, kick off, send and receive, uh, 22 dropout, send and receive. There's certain things that you can, you're starting from a set play almost, and you can orchestrate the pieces on the chessboard a little bit. But what happens then when you go four, five, six phases and the set play hasn't worked out or something has happened, which inevitably we will in sport, um, how do you adapt to that chaotic environment then? Mm -hmm. When, oh, you know, oh my God, you know, uh, we didn't go A, B, C, we've gone like A, D, back to B, you know, now we're over at Z, like what do we do? Um, and I think this is where Stuart Lancaster has been really, really good in terms of his philosophy, when I was there anyway, was like uh, comfortable in chaos. So he would have structure to the general week and how we train and stuff like that. Uh, so you, you, you would know what kind of the day, what kind of day is ahead of you and stuff like that. But the actual training environments, he would purposely say, uh, set up structured drills but the drills themselves would be quite chaotic. So he would overload the defense. You have more defense than attack or more attack than defense, depending on what day, if it was a defense day or attack day. 
and then be really unstructured attack or really unstructured defense or he would you know he would fatigue you doing like these crazy long fitness drills fatiguing you mentally and physically and then trying to like come up with a play in that chaotic environment to react to a certain situation um, and that comfortable in chaos uh, philosophy allowed a lot of lads to adapt and he never constricted any players in terms of like uh, what being themselves in how they played in terms of willing to offload if anything's on go for it you know um, very much let a bit of chaos into the game and that little bit of chaos basically meant you could you could try and bring out your 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 way you played or the type of player or type of boxer that you were um, when given the chance and I think that's been the 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 evolution of the game to a certain certain degree built on the foundation of having that that structure uh, and that kind of um, set piece kind of philosophy just to build on and then what's the current Leinster set up and their view on what Andy's talking about, the, the Instagram and the flashiness and allowing you to try, like, I mean, Ty Furlong's brilliant on Instagram, for example. I, I can't imagine they're actually talking to him and saying, you shouldn't be doing this sort of stuff. I presume it's a, a fairly free environment on that front. Yeah, like, I mean, I think anything with it is like, you know, the, the, the group would have, would have established their own common values. So they would, you know as long as he can stand over himself and, and it kind of adheres to kind of the values that they're all part of and, and within their own, let's say, policies that they've set as well, because they all have different policies that they set up. Mm. You know, what, uh, what environments can be posted in, when can you post, that sort of stuff. Outside of that, like, I don't think, I think you're naive in trying to stifle it because, like, you have kids now, like, Jordan Larmer, like, I was closer in age to Stuart Lancaster when I played than Jordan Larmer when he joined the squad. And, like, you're talking to someone like Jordan or, or even Gary Ringrose and they're like they had to when they kind of came part of the squad they had to go back and like filter their Instagram account and filter their Facebook account because you have this whole generation who only know mm. social media like 10 years ago I was playing in South Africa uh, for the lines there was Facebook wasn't even a thing here Instagram didn't exist YouTube was only about 4 or 5 years old Twitter I think was maybe alive for about two, three years at that stage. You know what I mean? Um, it's a different field now. You can't, you can't control that stuff. No, you absolutely can't. Uh, Paul, the very end of your career is interesting and kind of uh, a similar enough thing. I mean, the, the youth players in the club having a very big say in terms of their personalities in particular, because you've spoken in the past about Derby County in particular yeah. and some of the younger players and their treatment of Steve McLaren, uh, how that was indicative of what was to come in terms of the power shift in a dressing room. Um, yeah, I thought they... They answered him back and stuff like that, and I didn't think that was... I mean, I was on the sidelines, so I didn't, uh, you know, physically train with them. So I could hear them, you know, if he, if he was trying to give them instructions and stuff like that. They would actually answer him back, and I found that very disturbing, really, to be honest. As a, He shouldn't answer back the coaches, and he was trying to give them good advice and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I, just, I suppose I just would have said it to one or two of them. You know, what's all the shouting back at the coaches for and stuff like that and um, they just went on their merry way and did it anyway so it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't something that I was involved in you know what I mean because because uh, but I found it disturbing that that was the way football was going like that people would actually shout back at a coach who's trying to improve your game I, I, I didn't I didn't get it at all am I generalizing too much to say that the dressing room power has shifted since that point oh, that was the beginning yeah yeah, definitely. I mean, you see it today, and I, I don't know whether there's too many um, Man United supporters in here, but Paul, Paul, Paul seems to live in a world, uh, Paul Pogba, I should say, sorry, seems to live in a world of his own, like where he, he, can, he, he thinks he can run Manchester United because he's so powerful on, on this, that and the other. And he can't, you know, it just, well, if they're idiots if they let it happen anyway. I'd have him out of the club. Sell him immediately. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah sell him immediately got a good reaction yeah like that would be the kind of uh, counterpoint to what other people will say is that you've got to allow personalities like that to thrive in a dressing room but there is a line i guess isn't there especially for one person to have that much of a say within a dressing room well, well there was when me and norman were playing we were out of the club so and paul thinks he's all things to all people i think i think he's a fabulous footballer that's the problem i have with it he's so young he's 20 23 or 4 i think He's a fabulous footballer, but he doesn't. He's concentrating on so many other things, like silver watches and whatever watches he gets from whichever people. But he should be concentrating on playing football because he's a good footballer. 
And if he did concentrate on football, Manchester United would fly up the league. I guess it's no surprise to you to see then that someone like Alex Ferguson had such longevity in the game, the way he managed to control a dressing room, the way he managed to have uh, just the right amount of individuality. Yeah, I think, I think it was brilliant to get rid of the, the, the two he did, myself and Norman, because <laughs> that, 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 that started the bridge, and the bridge got... I know, and then he had a, a glut of uh, young lads coming in behind us, the 92 lads. They were, <laughs> they were hard to play against those boys as well. So it was brilliant to see what, what he put back, you know, uh, to what he gave back, I should say, to Manchester United, was their pride. And they still have it, but at the moment, like, people say to me, or last season they were saying, will they finish fourth and stuff, and I'm going, Jesus, that's, that's sad to think that Manchester United are fighting to, to try and finish fourth. And, uh, and the laziness that you see when you're watching a game, now, I, like I say, people are saying, lazy and you didn't even train, but... <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm no, 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 no. I mean, actually, on the football pitch on a Saturday, you can see people jogging back, and I don't. That's a, you know, if I was on the pitch on Saturday, I gave it my all. I don't, I don't understand people who wouldn't, for especially for a club like that, and even Derby, I was sprinting around the place like a hooligan. <laughs> you know, I was, I was trying to, I was trying to do my best for the club that, uh, for a club that wanted to pay my wages, so that I was delighted to run around like a fool. <laughs> I guess there's that and there's leading by example on the pitch and Jamie that's one of, one of the last things that I wanted to chat to you about in particular was the idea of putting a, a label on that idea of setting the example in training which is becoming the captain for a team. When the, the word captain is mentioned to you do you reflect happily on your time as captains for the various teams? Uh, yeah like it's a huge huge honour to be uh, you know a representative of any group you know what I mean and, and to be a group to represent to be lucky enough to represent the club that you, is the only club you ever really wanted to play for when you're young, and then to be able to represent, uh, you know, be captain of your country as well uh, and lead them out onto the field is, is like, it was, you know, top of the mountain stuff for me, you know what I mean? It was a, it was a dream come true, um, and, and I, I, I loved it. You know, there's a lot of stuff that comes with it, and some of that stuff I was, I was good with, some of the stuff I was deemed not good with. Um, <laughs> But like that's that's just uh, that's what you, you that's what you get with the gig, you know. In terms of captains that I've I've played under, you know, I probably, you know, my my the, the, my biggest inspiration and someone I learned so much of uh, was Paul O'Connell, um, by far the best leader that I have ever been around, um, and I probably learned more off him over that two-year period when he came back from his injury and took over the captaincy um, than, I, than, I, than I ever did in, in, in rugby in terms of how to be, how to be a kind of a leader amongst, uh, amongst the group. Um, like, really, a guy who, he was, A, he, he didn't talk that much, really, you know what I mean? But he, and, and I would be carved out of that stone of, don't be the guy who's shouting in the change room the whole lot, because shouting in the change room, that's not going to get it done. Like what's going to get it done is what happens on the field, and um, the the output of of the field, of what happens on the field is the input of what you do put in during not just that week, but that month, that year. You know what I mean? Those years, um, and so you kind of kind of want to walk to walk, not necessarily talk to talk. But Paulie also had a really good kind of emotional intelligence that we talked about in terms of awareness of the group and how the group is feeling, and then you know how to how to convey and deal and work with Joe as well to, to bring that along and kind of get the right blend as well because you know um, Joe can 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 be constrictive you know what I mean in you know in that kind of pressure cooker environment of being in camp mm. you know what I mean and he was Paulie was good to kind of help let off a bit of steam for want of a better word because I think for the Paul O'Connell one it was a fairly sort of matter of fact cold statement from Joe uh, or maybe I'm getting those mixed up, and that was actually how he delivered the Roy Best news to you. Uh, they were both, they were both, yeah. Joe did it to like did it to me in like the the area we used to warm up outside our team room. Like I was just happened to be walking past, and he's like, "Oh, Jamie, come here." Yeah, by the way, Paul's going to be captain. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay." okay." Like it's kind of, you know what it's like. It's like it's like getting picked for a team or getting dropped for a team. Like. The coach is the boss. Like, he's made the decision. What, like, is there any point, like, crying about it or giving out to him about it? Like, you're not going to change. It's not like you're going to, oh, I'm going to change his mind. Mm. You know what I mean? 
it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? So you just got to wear it. And, you know, you know how you can do two things in life. You know, you can react with, you can, you can interpret a situation how you react to a situation. That's the two options when something happens to you. You know what I mean? And for me, it was more like, okay, yeah, this is going to hurt your ego, da 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 da. But like, you know, you have the opportunity here to kind of, you know, react like a, like the man you want to be, you you want to be, and then kind of show others how you want to be. And how, you, are you going to be that person that throws toys out of pram? Are you going to be that guy who goes like, you know, I'm going to park that, and I want to be successful in this team and and, and move on with that. But um, with with Bestie, what did he do with me, Bestie? Oh yeah, he called me to like a a coffee shop. I got a phone call off Joe, and I never really got phone calls off Joe. I was like, oh shit, I know what this is going to be about. So he goes, look, let me meet you in this place, it's grand. And I go over to him, and uh, yeah, he just kind of goes, there's a little, like, again, not exactly five minutes of small chat with Joe. <laughs> and uh, it was straight into it, and he's just like, yeah, I'm going bestie. And I was just like, Right. And now I, in that, in that situation, that, that was the, I didn't go off on him, but I told him, like, my contract was coming up. And um, it was kind of the one thing that I, I would have liked to have done. Uh, but it's not something that you, obviously, it's something you're given. It's not something you can kind of work towards, I suppose. You've got to earn it, really. And, you know, he, he deemed Bestie the better choice. And, you know, that's, that's perfectly, obviously, that's what he wants to do. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to think where I want to go now with my career. Do I want to stay in Ireland or do I want to go uh, abroad and, and kind of play just club footy and not international rugby? But I obviously, you know, the green of Ireland was too much for me, so I wanted to stay around and play for Ireland. Maybe Schmidt realised that about you, that you would take it in that manner, and that's why he was so short and curt with what he said about those two options. Yeah, like, like he probably knows my personality, that like I, I'm an engineer at heart. I like things black and white. Mm. I don't like grey you know what I mean? Just rip it off like a plaster and tell me, and tell me how it is. Um, which he did. And obviously he does know me very well. Um, yeah, it wasn't nice. Like, I'm not going to tell you that. You know, it wasn't good because it's the same year, like, Issa came back and, and Issa was made captain as well. So I was like, oh, this is fucking great. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> this is brilliant. Like, what else? Want to take my contract too? Like, um, well, you know, to be honest though, like, I've always said a plane, yeah, um, the thing I cared about most playing was winning, if I'm honest. I want, I, and, and I wanted to be able... The reason I wanted to win so much in, in, our, in, in, in blue of Leinster or green for Ireland is because it's a simple thing. When you come into the change room, the jersey's hung up on a, pay, on a, on a hanger for you in your, in your spot. But the thing is, it's not like... It's, it's different to, like, soccer, you know what I mean? Where, or, like, I'm a big American football fan and, and basketball fan. Your, your name isn't on the back of the jersey. Rugby, your name is net in rugby, your names are never on the jersey, obviously. And for me, that always encapsulated what it was about. It was all about the group, and it was all about you didn't own that jersey. You got the opportunity to wear it for a day, so when you took it off the peg, you better put it back on in a better spot. And so every time I played, or for my career, I would like to think that when I got a chance to wear it, the first time back in Leinster was 2005, Ireland was 2006, that when I finished in 2017, that hopefully it was in a better place. So whoever takes it on, like Jack Conan right now, uh, who I think should be starting for Ireland, um, should, should, you know, he, he's, he's, he's doing things that I, could, I couldn't do, you know what I mean? And that's just, that's, that's great because it's at that standard and Jack's going to take it on now. Do you think that that'll be a decision that's replicated? That Joe Schmidt is like actually a fancy Conan as opposed to Sander here? What do you mean? Call, who's going to pick? Yeah. Do you think it's a possibility? What? Would he call, what? Would he pick that he'll Jack? start Conan over CJ Sander in the World Cup? Uh, like, you know, I think he should. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I think Jack should start eight. That doesn't mean CJ doesn't start. Sure. Um, but uh, I think Jack should start eight, but like, that's, that's me, you know what I mean? Um, I think he was the informed number eight last year in, in Ireland, but that's just me, sorry. Um, Paul, what makes a great captain? Pardon? What makes a great captain? Um, someone who wants to be captain. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's actually no, a really good point. Yeah. No, ser seriously. <laughs> no, but uh, no, Jack, Jack, Jack asked um, when he first came over here after that deplorable uh, session he had in the gym with the colours. He asked, he, he, he came up to me in the hotel and he said, I want you to take the ball out. And I went, What? And he said, I want you to take the ball out, meaning he wanted me to be captain. 
and I sprinted to uh, um, Liam Brady and Frank Stapleton, nearly crying, because I said, he wants me to take... I know what that means, he wants me to be captain. And I'm not, uh, I'm not one of these lads who's going to scream at people and shout at people and, you know, actually be a captain. So, 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 so... No, sir. No, I, I'm being serious, actually. So uh, Frank and, and uh, Liam Brady just went to Jack and just, and just said, Paul, he doesn't talk to anyone on the pitch anyway. So, so he, he, he just does, doesn't want to be captain. So I was delighted with that as well. I, was, I think I was captain one time when I, on my 50th cap or something like that, but that was all. What do you think, Lena, about that? Is it something you mull over quite a bit as to what makes the best leader in a dressing room? Yeah, well, it's, it's a good point because sometimes people, at least you have the courage to say no to it. Mm, sometimes okay. people are asked and they're, oh, yeah, and then they're not particularly good at the job, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I would be of the, the same opinion that the, the best leaders, they're, they're the ones that they, it's how they hold themselves, you know. Okay. If I'm going to follow you and you're going to be my leader, my, you know, I can't question your commitment or anything about what you're doing. You know, I have to have full belief that you are committed to this group. So often that isn't the, the flashy player. It isn't, it's, it's somebody who just fully believes in the group and all their actions convey that. Like that, because you've got to follow them. And same thing with a manager, how they, or a coach, whatever, how they hold themselves around the environment and, and on and off the field. You know, you've got mm. to believe in that individual yeah, as an individual. I'd agree, you know? yeah, totally. Yeah, but I, I just didn't have it, um, you know. I yeah, but you had the courage to say no, which is even in, in a thank God. bigger. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> Jesus. That's a massive thing, like because people just see, oh, Captain, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, yeah, and they're yeah, crap. Like. So. Good, good yeah. team, good teams now as well, like that I that I've been a part of, been around, have like leadership groups normally. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So they'll have like six, seven, eight players of that group, where you know if one is not like because of injury or whatever. Um, like the others kind of take up the flack, but in general, like week in, week out, it's the, it's the group that are driving it. And it's their different personalities and, and the different ways that they, like some might be flashy, some might not, some might not say a whole lot, but are really good, you know, actions. Or then you might have someone like Sexto who just barks at you all day long, you know what I mean? Um, and the, but the, the whole personalities kind of come together to be a real good kind of leadership cohort. For sure. Like Andy, that's something that was so important in your career, trying to surround yourself with the right people to try and create that outside the ring leadership group, the people closest to you or the people that you trust to drive forward your career. Yeah, and in boxing it's difficult because the lines are always blurred um, because it is a business as well as a sport and the people who are around you, they have an interest like in terms of when you win, they win and when you get paid, they're getting paid out of it. So it's it's it's... It, you learn as you go who, who to trust and who not to trust. Um, and you find it as you go, you know, you find it. And, you, you, you know, and I think when you lose a fight or whenever you lose a fight, that's when you find out who, who, the, who are the people who should be there when the times are good again, you know, because um, they're there because they care, you know. I don't know. I was one thing that, like, you got, I'm sure a lot of you would have saw Anthony Joshua lose the other day. Yeah. And one thing that struck me about it, his reaction, whatever, Eddie Hearn's reaction in, in the ring after the fight. He wasn't like, he wasn't, he didn't once mention that, oh, I just hope Anthony's okay, or, you know, he had a tough fight, he fought a good fighter, and he got beat, but he'll come back, he'll be okay, he's, he's healthy. He was just only talking about the ramifications of it in terms of the promotion and the money it's going to lose them, and, and that said a lot to me, you know. So yeah. you find these, he, like, he'll be finding out these things, who are the people who, who, who really care now. And that's, 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 that's the lesson, like, you learn so much in defeat, more so than ever in defeat, about yourself, about how to improve and also about the people around you. Because you're a coach and a manager at the moment, is, is, that, <laughs> is that part of the idea that no matter how good a coach you are, it doesn't matter what, how good I am, because if he's managing the wrong way, if he doesn't have the right people looking after him, yeah. my coaching is all going to be for nothing. Yeah, and, um, you know, the chain and in box the food whatever like you know there's the promoter and and then there's the manager then there's the trainer and then there's the fighter is the last one um and so by me being both of those things and also being a phone fight i can kind of lessen the lessen those links you know and and ha like i'm seeing him every day i know what he's doing i know how hard he's working i know what he's capable of 
So I'll I'll be able to match him with this opponent, yeah, he can fight that guy off. No, that's a step up too too soon for him. And um and uh, yeah, there's there's a number of benefits for me fulfilling those two roles and hopefully I can teach him or he can avoid the mistakes that I made, you know, for for all those for all those years I had. It's early days yet, but what's been the most enjoyable thing about being a coach? <sighs> just seeing him, him doing something that you say to do, you know, it's just you know, it is a nice, it is powerful, you know, it's like, well, no, I, no, I mean, no, I mean, like, saying, like, if I show him how to throw a punch a certain way, and he works and it works and it works and it, and then next week he's doing it naturally, that's good. And, uh, like, I'm not, I didn't, I didn't mean, like, I do 50 sprints and then he has to do it, no, then, <laughs> that's also fun to go, but I don't do that. No, 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 no. Uh, you hate Instagram, but of course everybody can check out uh, Andy's coaching on his Instagram account. Oh, yeah, uh, he's put yeah. it up there this week. Uh, can we give it up for our fantastic guests tonight? Thanks very much. They've been brilliant. Paul McGrath, Tino O'Connor, Jamie Heaslip, and Andy Lee. Yeah. Can I get a big thank you as well to everybody at Free Now, Niall Carson and Ailish O'Donnell as well. Uh, to the Alex Hotel, of course, for hosting us tonight. Brilliant, brilliant venue. And finally, a big thank you to our beautiful audience tonight. Thank you so much for coming along. Have a safe night. Thank you.